nuestra lucha por la seguridad social en América Latina y el Caribe, en la cual también hemos podido compartir y conocer experiencias, por ejemplo, de países de Europa del Este, en esta lucha por la recuperación de la seguridad social y la desprivatización de los sistemas de pensiones. Eh, recordar que este seminario es organizado por Fundación Sol junto a Fundación Rosa Luxemburgo, la Conferencia Interamericana de Seguridad Social, CIS, el Instituto de Investigaciones Económicas de la UNAM, eh, el Instituto Argentino de Desarrollo Económico y el Grupo de Trabajo CLACSO en Seguridad Social y Sistemas de Pensiones. Estamos cerrando esta actividad en la que han participado cerca de eh, 18 países, ¿verdad? Eh, contando distintas experiencias y procesos, compartiendo un elemento en común, ¿verdad? Compartiendo en común eh, un momento histórico, una organización mundial del capitalismo que tiene ciertas características, ¿verdad? Y que, de alguna forma, van marcando también los desarrollos particulares de cada Estado-Nación. En ese contexto, la conferencia magistral de, a continuación, con el profesor Costas Lapavitzas, eh, tiene como objeto enmarcar todas estas experiencias y esta lucha por la seguridad social en el contexto de un capitalismo financiarizado y en la actual crisis que se vive a nivel mundial. El profesor eh, Costas Lapavitzas es profesor de el SOAS de la Universidad de Londres, ¿verdad? la Escuela de Estudios Orientales y Africanos de la Universidad de Londres, eh, es autor de importantes obras, ¿verdad? Sobre todo, por ejemplo, en, en español hemos tenido acceso, por ejemplo, al capitalismo financiarizado, eh, la crisis de la eurozona, o beneficios sin producción, por ejemplo, como algunas producciones relevantes, y mantiene un activo trabajo académico, ¿verdad? Pero también de intervención en los procesos concretos eh, a nivel mundial, ¿verdad? En ese contexto agradecemos eh, al profesor Costas y agradecemos a todas y todos quienes nos acompañan eh, en este seminario que estamos organizando, ¿verdad? Entre varias instituciones, pero sobre todo desde Fundación Sol. Eh, agradecer en ese contexto e invitarles a que puedan eh, dejarnos sus preguntas, que puedan compartir sus dudas en las distintas plataformas en que se transmite eh, este seminario en vivo y eh, de esa forma podremos, al finalizar la presentación del profesor, podremos comentar alguna de estas preguntas e ir avanzando ¿cierto? en este debate, esta discusión sobre la crisis, eh, las pensiones ¿verdad? en este contexto de un capitalismo financiarizado. Eh, sin más preámbulos entonces, y agradeciendo eh, su participación, eh, les dejo con el profesor Costas Lapavitzas. Okay. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be um, here with you. Um, it is a pleasure to um, address um, the foundation, but also more broadly uh, the, the guests from uh, Latin America and from the Caribbean. The issue is of paramount importance, uh, social security and of the crisis that's happening at the moment. And I want to discuss a number of these aspects with you. I don't claim to have any great knowledge of the pension system in all these different countries, but I do understand how pensions work in financialized capitalism. And I want to give you some uh, basic ideas of what's been happening to the pension systems and why uh, in contemporary capitalism on the basis of which um, demands can be made about an alternative that would be in the interest of working people and that could deal with the dysfunctional uh, systems that uh, we're faced with uh, at the moment. So if I am right on this, I will now share my screen. Um, and presumably you can see um, the PowerPoint now. Um, I will do, the title of the talk is Financialized Capitalism in Decline, a Pensions Disaster. Um, I want to do basically three things. I want to discuss financialization, 
and in particular subordinate financialization, financialization in developing countries. I then want to discuss the nature of the current crisis, the pandemic crisis. And I want to finish with a brief discussion of the Chilean uh, pension system as an exemplar of the pension crisis in so many different developing countries, but also developed countries. Uh, it's an ambitious uh, aim, but we will go slowly and I think um, possibly clear ideas will emerge. So let me start first of all uh, with a, couple, a few observations about the pandemic crisis. Um, the pandemic crisis is important for a number of reasons. It's an unusual crisis, an extraordinary crisis. But it's important because it shows the structural weaknesses and the exploitative character of financialized capitalism. It has demonstrated these things uh, very clearly. More than that though, the pandemic crisis for me um, has demonstrated that the state, the nation state, as an, is, is the main pivot of both globalization and financialization. All that talk for so many years about the market dominating the state, the state being um, powerless, the state being weak and so on, has been shown to be completely empty. Uh, the state is very powerful. Um, not only is it powerful, the state can also go against neoliberal um, principles and neoliberal policies very clearly when it needs to do it in order to defend particular interests. The pandemic has shown it very clearly and I will argue how that is. At the same time, the state remains weak. There are weaknesses within the state, significant weaknesses within the state. The neoliberal state is both enormously powerful and enormously weak. And we need to understand that in order to uh, move forwards. In addition to that, the pandemic crisis has shown that really neoliberalism is in historic decline. The high point of neoliberalism is over. Uh, it can dominate, it will, it will continue to dominate, but the high point of its uh, historic domination is over. Um, and the pensions crisis that we see in Latin America and elsewhere is an indication of the historic failure um, of neoliberalism. And it is of course opposite that the sharpest pension crisis in this respect is in Chile, where neoliberal practices began to be applied to developing countries uh, at the very beginning uh, of the process. In a sense, it, the disaster returns back to itself, to its beginning here. But let me start by uh, putting some meat on the bones and um, sum up what I think is important about uh, developed financialized capitalism, and then I will talk about subordinate financialized capitalism. My own view of developed financialized capitalism is fairly straightforward. I think that what has happened the last three to four decades is a structural transformation. Um, and the structural transformation matters for understanding obviously social security. The first and most fundamental transformation has to do with um, the productive structure, it has to do with the corporates, the non-financial the non corporates, the, the enterprises that produce and trade. And there, the key thing is that they relate to banks differently. They relate to financial operations, to financial institutions differently to before. And uh, they rely on uh, using markets, financial markets, and they rely on using their own funds for investment. Big businesses, I'm talking about big businesses in both developed and developing countries, although here I'm focusing for the moment on developed, use these funds to play games in um, financial markets and to make financial profits. The key point here is the relationship between financial capital and non-financial capital in contemporary capitalism is not what a lot of people imagine. In other words, the banks tell corporates what to do. That's not how it works. Corporates, non-financial corporates are very powerful um, they've got a, a, an independent and equal relationship with banks. Actually, they, tell, they often tell the banks what to do and um, they use finance in order to draw profits. In this context, 
Second change is that banks have shifted their operations. They engage in financial market transactions. They seek to earn fees, commissions, and so on. They become financial transactors. And crucially, they've turned to households. Household lending has become a major activity for uh, big banks and also for international banks. And the third change is visible, and in some ways the most visible transformation of financialization. Households have come to rely on private finance. Working people, individuals and households have come to rely on private finance for housing, for health, uh, for education, and obviously for uh, consumption, for basic consumption. Crucially, and that is something that a lot of people in political economy and elsewhere don't notice, households rely on formal finance for all these things for which they get debts, uh, they borrow. But households also rely on private finance for their assets it, because it isn't simply uh, debts that households have. They also have assets, savings, uh, and pensions are the main form of saving. And the financialization of pensions is one of the most crucial aspects of um, developed country uh, financialized uh, capitalism. Not much about, in a sense, the core of the world economy. But obviously here we're also interested in developing countries. We're interested in peripheral countries, in the periphery, in the smaller parts, the, the dominated parts of the world economy. So what matters here is subordinate financialized capitalism, not the dominant uh, financialized capitalism uh, of the United, United States, uh, Britain, Japan, Germany, France, and so on, but subordinate financialized capitalism. And here, this concept which has become increasingly uh, used in analysis as it should be relates more closely to latin america to many countries in latin america and elsewhere because that kind of financialization we see in uh, latin america is different to financialization in the united states and britain and so on because it is subordinate it is derivative it is actually financialization that comes from uh, mechanisms and processes that originate in the developed countries, um, which continue to dominate the world market and continue to dominate the uh, world financial system. And it is derivative, subordinate, because fundamentally it is based on capital flows, liberalized capital flows, which are a, 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 which are a, a basic lever for financialization in, develop, in developing countries. They are based also on reserve accumulation. Developing countries have to accumulate reserves to, of dollars usually to continue participating in the global system. And they, uh, uh, it, it's also subordinate because it relies on the entry of foreign banks into developing countries. Foreign banks bring with them financialization and financialization practices. So in all these respects, capital flows, reserve accumulation and foreign bank presence uh, the financialization of Latin America or and other countries is subordinate, derivative of financialization elsewhere. And this is very, very important for understanding how it works. Because the fact that it is derivative also means that it is very different from country to country. It is actually specific to countries and, and varies from place to place, although it also has common characteristics. What are these common characteristics? I will mention two which you can see on the slide, which are very important for us now. Large corporates, uh, big business in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, and so on, are now uh, very capable and very able of, to, of borrowing abroad. They borrow abroad. They borrow abroad in uh, foreign currencies, um, but they also use domestic markets for finance, and they use domestic markets for market finance, for borrowing by borrowing, borrowing by issuing their own financial assets. And that is often connected to banks. They remain connected to banks, but the connection with banks is through markets uh, in, in a lot of developing countries. There is, in other words, advancing financialization of big business uh, in this respect, mediated by the banks. <clears throat> Second and crucial, households are also in, in these developing countries are drawn into formal finance to borrow for consumption, but also to borrow for pensions. What is different uh, 
between developing and developed countries in this respect is that in developing countries, in Chile, in Argentina, in Turkey, um, in, South, in, in, in South Africa, households that borrow, borrow more clearly for consumption uh, because they have to supplement wages. Um, in developed countries, they borrow for housing. Um, that you don't get so much in, in, in developing countries. But certainly, uh, in many developing countries, households in, of subordinate, subject to subordinate financialization, financialization have also been uh, relying on private finance for pensions. And that is really what I want to come back to uh, throughout this talk. Now, this is broadly the system, the framework that um, we're living in. This is the capitalism of today. And it is an, unsta an unstable and an unsustainable system. It's both unstable and unsustainable. Uh, it is interesting to observe and very important that there are new forms of exploitation. There, are, there is financial expropriation, um, the involvement of households and of several other agents, economic agents into formal capitalist finance means that there is new sources of profit, direct extraction from income or from people's uh, savings and so on. Zero sum games being, are being played uh, and profits are made by speculators and uh, financiers by involving uh, households and others uh, in, in, in uh, financial uh, transactions. Crucial to, 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 to uh, how it works, however, beyond the new forms of exploitation, are the new alliances between industrial and financial capital. Um, dominating particular countries and dictating um, social structures and influencing social struggles. And I'll come back to that when we talk about Chile. Um, these new alliance be alliances between industrial and financial capital, which are crucial for developing countries. Last but not least, there are new forms of surplus transfer from the periphery to the core. Um, surplus transfer, which, which is based on capital flows, free capital flows, and the role of the dollar. Um, the, the subordinate financialization pivots on the, on the global role of the dollar as the world reserve currency, world money, uh, uh, which is the, the role is dominated by the dollar, allowing the United States to extract uh, enormous privileges and obviously returns as well. It's a kind of tribute paid to the United States by developing countries as part of um, uh, financialization. So this is a deeply unstable system and crisis prone. Uh, it's been marked by repeated crisis. Any system, any form of capitalism that makes finance very important will tend to crisis. Finance is a very, very unstable mechanism. Uh, and finance also exacerbates the um, inherent instability of capitalism in production and in trade and so on. Uh, so we witnessed that, and it's been a repeated process of crisis, none greater than the crisis of 2007-2009. Um, it is also a system, however, that rests on the state. It's very clear. Financialization would not have happened without the state. Financialization in developing countries, subordinate financialization would not have happened without the state. Yes, developing countries financialize because they take part in the global financial system, but, but, but the state in, in developing countries also facilitates that process in a variety of uh, crucial ways. Um, and the last thing, neoliberalism is the ideology and the policy framework of this uh, form of capitalism. Now, I want to push on um, and bring it to today uh, as quickly as I can. What can we say about where we are now in the pandemic? Well. The period since the crisis of 2007-2009 is very important because it's a period of weakened financialization. I don't want to go over the causes of the crisis 2007-2009. I think they are well understood. An enormous bubble in the United States uh, financed by domestic financial uh, speculation and expansion, great flows between Europe and the United States banks, of European banks and, 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 and American banks, a tremendous bubble that, that uh, then exploded and, 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 and crisis followed for several years. What is, it, uh, what is of more interest here is what, what happened afterwards. Now, 
The 10 years that followed that crisis were years of weakened financialization. I stress that because it's important in order to understand the pandemic and the shock of the pandemic. Financialization was weakened in a variety of ways. The most important way, which I've measured in my own work and I've spent some time on it, is historically weak profitability um, of finance and of industry. A lot of people imagine that profitability in finance is always high. That's not the case. Um, and the profitability of finance globally, um, the last 10 years, um, has been uh, significantly lower than before. After the crisis, finance has not been able to make the uh, great profits that it did previously. The world continued to be financialized, of course, but uh, none of the profit, uh, easy profit making um, of um, uh, the period before. Um, at the same time, we had weak investment and uh, weak growth. The key countries of the world uh, economy, the main centers of financialization, were essentially caught in stagnation. It was a situation of stagnation. The world remained financialized, financialization was weak, and we had phenomena of stagnation in several uh, of the mature countries, the, 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 the core of the world economy. At the same time, household and uh, intrabank debt declined in the United States, especially. Uh, less financial uh, activity in the United States and elsewhere. Corporate debt, though, and I'll come back to it, in other words, big business debt began to increase. And big business debt is important for the story of uh, Chile and elsewhere uh, as, uh, as we move um, ahead. Um, unlike what was happening in the core of the world economy, however, since the crisis, financialization of developed countries continued. It continued and it proceeded, uh, it expanded. The difference even there, however, was that the um, capital flows, including foreign direct investment flows, were weaker than before. We didn't see the same kind of expansion uh, since the great crisis that we saw previously. Um, uh, yes, subordinate financialization. Uh, yes, financialization, financialization of Chile and elsewhere, but nothing like um, the period before that. Uh, now, in this in this context, um, in this context, when the pandemic hit, what we saw was the extraordinary role of the state. How um, the state faced with uh, uh, faced with uh, 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 weakened financialization was confronted with uh, a shock created by the pandemic, was confronted with a shock which was essentially a health shock. Um, confronted with a health shock, the state showed both its power uh, and its weakness, uh, which is currently without precedent. How? The state, first of all, when the, when the, um, when the crisis hit, uh, catalyzed the crisis by imposing um, lockdowns. It imposed lockdowns and it catalyzed the crisis by creating a triple shock. A shock to supply, aggregate supply. It disrupted product production chains across the world. Um, a shock to demand because it shut down the service sector and a number of other um, key economic activities. And a shock initially to stock markets and to international um, uh, capital flows. The initial shock was dramatic, dramatic and very great. And it was created by the state, by the state's response to um, the pandemic. In other words, what we had was weakened financialization, hit by the pandemic, and then state action, which catalyzed the tremendous crisis. Even more important than that, though, was the response of the state to that. Once the crisis emerged, then again, we saw the state swing and begin to confront the crisis that it itself had helped create by going against neoliberalism. It actually went against neoliberalism and it's worth spending a bit of time on this to get the point clear about what's happening at the moment. I'm talking about the period from the beginning of this year to now. 
the first part in understanding uh, how the crisis was confronted is to appreciate that uh, the, the leading states of the world engaged in active and extraordinary monetary policy. Never seen it, we've never seen anything like that before. Nothing like of this magnitude, and I will show you some evidence in a minute. Um, the United States, in particular, which has been a leading state in this, engaged in extraordinary uh, monetary policy. And the reason why it was able to do it is because, of course, the state in financialized capitalism controls money through the central bank. The power of the state comes from that. So what it did was to drive interest rates to zero. Now, or even negative in some countries. Now, I want to stress this. Zero interest rate capitalism, which is what we've got at the moment, which is what we've had for many time, many years before in, in, in some countries, is a very, very unusual, paradoxical, historical um, uh, occurrence. The interest rate is an important price in capitalism. And the contemporary state, the financialized state, has driven the rate of interest down to zero in, in key countries, including now. Um, that's at the root of the pensions crisis as well. I want you to appreciate that. That is connected to the pensions crisis. Um, because when you drive a price like the rate of interest down to zero, you're going to be creating side effects and important um, complications, one of which is to do with um, the pensions crisis, and there are others as well. Um, so the state did that. At the same time, through the central bank, it provided enormous reserves. Um, to private banks, it expanded the money supply, and as that happened, it really led to tremendous growth of corporate borrowing. Uh, private capitalists began to borrow heavily uh, initially in the United States. And here is a little bit of evidence so that um, the point is made clear. Here is the, uh, the um, uh, federal funds rate in the United States, in other words, the main uh, state determined interest rate by the central bank. You can see that for many years it was close to zero. It rose, I mean, it looks far bigger than it is. Right? It only rose to two and a half percent. You mustn't think that it rose to anything very great, right? But from zero to two and a half percent, it looks big. Um, and it then declined again to zero uh, when the crisis hit. This has been the main lever of intervention, driving rates, uh, rates of interest to zero. When that happened, and as a result of that, this, this, this abundant uh, provision of um, money and credit, it led to the inevitable development. Here, are, here is a pattern of loans, what happened to commercial and industrial loans in the United States, a tremendous increase in borrowing by private business, which is not, it began to decline uh, after a while in, in 2020, but still the increase is phenomenal. Uh, that has been the main response by the state uh, in the uh, area of, of finance and monetary policy. But that's not all. Even more important than that has been the response of the, of the state in fiscal policy. And I'm talking again of the leading um, core financialized states. <clears throat> fiscal policy intervention has been extraordinary. We've never seen anything like it uh, in peace times. Um, uh, we've seen similar things in war, but not in peace time. Um, in, in, in essence, what the big states did were partially to nationalize the corporate wage bill. In other words, they took it upon themselves to pay the wages of large numbers of workers um, to prevent unemployment from increasing. They basically nationalized some elements of the wage bill. At the same time, um, they took it upon themselves, the states, to uh, protect the income statement, in other words, uh, the losses, to, take, to, to, to prevent losses among um, uh, big corporates. They nationalized, partially nationalized the income statement. Third, just as important in many cases, they made direct subventions of cash to households. They sent money uh, to households, uh, a, a form of basic income um, paid directly um, to broad layers uh, of households. Um, it's extraordinary. They, 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 that, that, those sets of measures are extraordinary because austerity was killed off, basically, uh, immediately. Uh, and states showed that they could spend, they were perfectly able to spend, and they could spend without um, precedent uh, in, in peace times. 
the result, well, you can see, the result is here. Here is the deficit uh, of um, US um, Treasury, which became very great uh, immediately. Uh, the state basically went into, um, uh, into redlining, into the, uh, uh, into the red as far as uh, its own uh, account is concerned. The result is, of course, a tremendous increase in uh, US public debt to GDP. Uh, the jump in public debt uh, is phenomenal. In short, what the pandemic did was to accelerate the processes that we'd observed in the 10 years since the great crisis, which is um, a, a gradual increase of state debt to replace the retreating household debt, and the pandemic increased uh, public debt uh, without precedent. You can see the evidence there. The United States has got levels of debt at the moment which are comparable to um, war times. Um, now, that much then about um, how the US, and uh, which is the leading country of financialization, dealt with um, um, the crisis so far. Now, in developing countries, the picture was a bit different inevitably, because financialization is subordinate and because their role in the world economy is not the same. The picture was different. And it was different, first of all, because the role of the dollar has remained paramount. Because whatever else the United States government did, it did not negotiate at all its stance with regard to the dollar. The dollar had to be defended as world, as world currency and the as well as well uh, reserve currency and the federal reserve made sure of that um, so developing countries continue to be um, embroiled in the uh, global system through the dollar the dollar is the main uh, uh, lever of that beyond that though we had the large shocks to the production chains of many developing countries um, disruption of production chains a shock to domestic income um, a decline in aggregate consumption and investment, and of course, an accumulation of private and, and, and public debt. For many developing countries, the shock has been enormous, and we will see the outcomes uh, in the coming year uh, of the accumulation of debt and of the difficulty created as domestic incomes declined and aggregate consumption and investment uh, increased. So let me now come to Chile, which is what I want to discuss. Uh, more specifically, where is Chile in all this, and what can we say about this pension system? Which, of course, we know that the crisis of the pension system in, in Chile predates uh, the pandemic shock. It's clear that um, it's been a it's been a process that's been unfolding for some time, and the pandemic shock has made things considerably worse. Um, now, in Chile is an interesting case for a variety of reasons in this. It's an interesting case because we've got subordinate financialization um, and we've got a strongly neoliberal policy um, framework. It's a country that um, invented neoliberal policies in many respects in the developing world, um, one of the first to adopt them. Um, it's a country that continues to uh, practice presumably free capital flows. And here's a floating exchange uh, rate, a floating exchange rate regime. Most developing countries um, usually target the exchange rate. They peg it. They try to, to defend it. And to a certain extent, that happens in Chile too. But, in, but to, all, to, to all intents and purposes, the, the, the system is um, uh, free and floating. <laughs> That's important also for pensions, which I will, as I will say in a minute. Um, third, Fiscal policy is very conservative. The regime is very conservative in this respect. And um, um, there's been growth of the financial sector during this period based on financialization of pensions. The role of the pensions um, um, mechanism and system in the financialization of Chile has been um, uh, remarkable for the financialization of the economy uh, as a whole. In a sense, subordinate financialization occurred in Chile partly through what happened to the pension system. So what is the pension system? Again, I don't, many of you will know much more than I do, but um, when I look at it, to me, it looks remarkably dysfunctional. The, the main parameters of it look remarkably dysfunctional. 
I don't think in terms of the popular response, I think it's widely accepted. Though the people who introduced it continue to believe that the system is very efficient. But if you look at it calmly, it seems to me remarkably dysfunctional. Why? It's a system, from what I understand, of defined contributions, um, no defined benefits, and individual accounts, a mandatory saving uh, of 10% of incomes, and crucially, insignificant employer contributions. Um, the funds are managed by private uh, institutions, most of which are foreignly, foreign owned, um, US and other countries. Um, so we've got a system of private collection of personal savings um, through legal uh, process, didn't happen spontaneously, the state created it that way, um, collected by these private um, uh, enterprises, which then proceed to allocate the investments. To a certain extent, this happens in all pension systems, but here, here we've got the uh, highly privatized system um, uh, in which the allocation of funds takes place uh, in a highly regulated way. How? This is a picture that was sent to me, a diagram that was sent to me by uh, colleagues at the Fundacion Sol, because I've been asking them for it, and they, they produced it. And I think um, the evidence it shows is interesting and very important, and I will put it in context by showing you some parallels with the UK system of pensions. Um, it's clear that what's been happening is that these, these institutions that have been collecting the funds privately um, have been allocating the funds fundamentally to um, um, uh, four sectors, um, uh, private enterprises, um, the state, um, foreign sector, and the financial sector. What is remarkable is the turn towards the foreign sector in the last um, 20 years, since the late 1990s. The internationalization of these enterprises, in other words, of these, of these, um, um, of these financial uh, institutions, the internationalization uh, as they became more um, entangled with the global system and as they became more dependent on capital flows, free capital flows, um, and the movement of the peso relative to uh, the dollar. This is all very important for uh, how um, the crisis emerged. It's interesting to note that similar processes occurred in the uh, British pension system, although the system is not as closely regulated as the Chilean system uh, in terms of the activities of the pension funds. But the pension funds in the British system, uh, the more that the country financialized, um, became more like freely operating financial uh, institutions with a global coverage, and they began to invest um, flexibly, they began to invest with the aim for returns uh, to, to secure high yield. Now, um, just in case, I mean, the Chileans among you will know, but just in case there was any doubt about how important this is, here is some evidence of the size of the pension fund assets to GDP. We're talking about a large um, part of the financial uh, system of the, and of the economy. The, uh, the, the total assets of that system uh, today are about 75% of GDP. So this is a large part of the um, economy and a, a major lever um, of uh, economic activity and financialization generally. Now, who are the users? Who are the, the users of the funds? Who are, who, are, who are taking advantage of the lending activities of these institutions? It's clear what's happening. Domestically, uh, the Chilean state has been borrowing from them by issuing bonds, banks, and large corporate groups. Now, the banks are obviously connected to large corporate groups too. In other words, what we get is um, a very strong case of subordinate financialization uh, operating through the pension, uh, um, pension mechanism. Uh, what, what has emerged is a, is a kind of very powerful, um, it looks to me, <laughs> hegemonic block in Chile, comprising large corporate groups, banks, and pension funds 
that between them take command of the people's savings and use them for private investment um, in, in the businesses that take advantage of that, the, the large conglomerates uh, of the country. Um, and they also um, use them, they use these savings for financial profits uh, by the institutions that are involved there. Internationally though, uh, the users of the funds are different states and large corporate groups. Chile has been acting as a financier of a number of different states and international corporate groups through its pension funds um, uh, institutions. Um, what have been the outcomes of this financialization then? It's a disaster. It's, no matter how you, you see it, it's a disaster. Um, it's now commonly um, uh, accepted in, in the literature and elsewhere that the system provides low coverage for working people. There are plenty of people who were not covered because um, of temporary or insecure employment or whatever reason. So these people are not um, covered. Um, the great majority of pensions are often less than the minimum wage. So it's basically a system of paying um, poverty pensions. Um, the institutions that run the, um, the mechanism are very expensive. The costs are very high. So there is no efficiency in this respect per unit of activity, despite the fact that they are private, or it's all talk that they are they're efficient. They are very expensive to, um, to operate and they cannot generate the expected returns. And the reason why they cannot generate the expected returns is of course related to the low interest rate policy that I pointed out to you earlier. When interest rates are driven close to zero and Chilean pension funds buy um, state debt, as do other pension funds across the world, then it is very difficult for them to generate the returns that they must generate in order to pay pensions. And that is one of the um, problematic implications of very low interest, zero interest rate policies followed by um, financialized capitalism. The last outcome, which is of crucial importance, is of course that by acting internationally, the Chilean um, uh, pension funds are actually catalysts of further financialization because in order to act internationally, they are among the biggest users of derivatives uh, in Chile. And they must be because they buy assets abroad. Um, they're exposed to the um, uh, exchange rate of the peso with the, the dollar and other currencies, the capital flows are free, therefore they must hedge and they must protect their portfolio, which means that they, 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 they are users of derivatives. In other words, the financialization of the country proceeds apace and they begin to operate like uh, uh, profit-making financial institutions, although the, the aim is to provide pensions. And it's no surprise that in this context, they cannot provide the pensions that uh, the originators thought that they would be able to do it. That's the context in which the pandemic hit Chile. This crisis has been brewing in Chile for a while. The failure of the system and, of, and the end of financialization in a sense, um, the historic, uh, the, the historic uh, bankruptcy of financialization has become clear in Chile for many years as people protested against um, uh, the inequities of the of the system and that's the context in which the pandemic hit well it's no wonder I mean it's a, it's a perfect storm I mean in in that context it's a perfect storm it's a perfect storm because um, of this to start with the unemployment rate jumped so so what was difficult to ensure in the first place because the returns were not there and because contributions were not um, adequate becomes even more problematic when unemployment increases. So uh, the ability of the pension system to meet the needs of the Chilean people with these rates of unemployment is just not non-existent uh, at, at the moment. Um, in addition, manufacturing production took a knock uh, because of the, um, of the crisis and crucially, private consumption seems to have uh, declined significantly from what I can gather from the data that I've, uh, uh, that I've seen. In that context, um, the pensions crisis has become even worse because people were forced to cash out basically some of their um, um, some of their pension uh, savings in order to survive in 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 a system in which um, 
unemployment rises, private uh, consumption suffers, um, the government doesn't intervene to support uh, people's incomes and so on, then it is quite logical that uh, given the opportunity, uh, people um, uh, cashed out the uh, pension plans and of course that creates enormous problems for the future. That makes it even more dysfunctional and even less able to deal with um, uh, future demands. Um, to me, again, it looks like a perfect storm and it is not easy to see how um, um, the situation will be resolved. And I want to finish by discussing, by, by briefly mentioning uh, some alternative just to indicate the difficulty of it. What alternative? In Chile and possibly elsewhere. Again, I'm no great expert, but I'll tell you why it looks to me um, from the work I've been doing on the system, on, on Chile for, um, in preparation for this. Um, it's clear that the private pension system has failed. It's been a lever of financialization and it, it is completely dysfunctional in terms of the returns it pays and it, it just secures large profits for the people who run the um, pension funds. Um, a, pu a public system is, is required. It's clear that the public system is required. The public component, such as it is, must be expanded and a public system must, must be put in place. The public system must be redistributive. The idea that individuals should have their own individual accounts and uh, everything should be in terms of defined benefits and uh, this is my money and nobody else's and no one should touch that is the wrong way to approach pensions. Pensions must be redistributive and mu they must be understood as a social obligation towards the poor, the weak and so on. There must be a redistributive element and that can only be ensured through a pay-as-you-go system. Pensions are basically a claim on current output. That's basically what it is. And society, any society that respects itself must make sure that the weak, the old, and the, those who cannot work like others are actually entitled to a share of current output. And that can only happen with a pay-as-you-go um, system. I, th I think this is beyond dispute and Chile has demonstrated the case for all uh, to see the last uh, few years. For that, of course, you need tax reform. It's clear that you need tax reform. <laughs> Such a system is impossible um, to sustain without tax reform. Uh, and that will raise uh, its head. These are all vital steps of definancialization uh, in Chile and elsewhere. Vital steps of definancialization, moving away from financialized capitalism as it has uh, prevailed, unfortunately, for decades. But you only have to spell them out to indicate the difficulty. Because I indicated originally that, to me, it looks like hegemonic bloc exists in Chile, which is very powerful, connecting big business to big banks and to uh, pension funds. Um, the system is dysfunctional, manifestly so, and financializing. Um, people are objecting to it for obvious reasons because it pays poverty, pensions, and it leaves a lot of people out and so on. But there are also significant layers, powerful layers that are making big profit and draw big benefits out of it, not least big business um, that gets the investment funds and, um, and, uh, and those who run the uh, the, the funds, uh, they will not um, willingly um, contemplate reform. So uh, any kind of um, change that will take place, it will require a social rupture. They, they will have to be contestation. It's impossible to happen otherwise. And those who wish to bring in uh, a more rational, more equitable, a fairer system that also um, goes against um, financialization, financialized capitalism must be prepared for a sustained um, and conscious uh, political struggle because that's what uh, lies ahead. In this regard, events such as this one are very, very useful or should be useful because uh, hopefully they clarify issues and they help people with the ideas that they need. That's all I had to say. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Bueno, Costas, eh, muchas gracias eh, por la presentación. Eh, la verdad es que entrega muchos elementos relevantes para poder observar eh, este contexto, ¿verdad?, en el que damos este debate sobre los sistemas de pensiones en distintos países del mundo, ¿verdad?, en particular en Chile. 
nos ayuda a entender también este, esto que se ha descrito a lo largo del seminario, ¿verdad? este verdadero lobby internacional del sector financiero por apoderarse de los sistemas de seguridad social justamente para eh, la especulación financiera. Eh, nos siguen desde distintos lugares, eh, de, de Chile, por ejemplo, de Ancú, ¿verdad? de Pucón, eh, de Santiago, de distintos lugares, eh, nos envían saludos y también algunas preguntas. Eh, recordar en ese contexto que, que nos pueden hacer llegar sus preguntas para profundizar sobre los elementos que nos entrega el profesor Costa Lapavitzas. Eh, y aquí podemos señalar una primera pregunta. Eh, la pregunta tiene que ver con si es posible eh, recuperar un sistema de pensiones con solidaridad intergeneracional, un sistema ellas y Hugo, ¿verdad? En este contexto de eh, capitalismo financiarizado. Y, y aquí, para com complementar ¿cierto? esta pregunta, ¿cómo es posible en un contexto de capitalismo de cero tasa de interés, como exponía el profesor, ¿verdad? Poder generar pensiones eh, con los ahorros. Eh, ¿Qué alternativas se presentan para la capitalización colectiva? Quizás está el tema de los impuestos, eh, que comentaba el profesor. Eh, sin duda esto es un, es un tema muy relevante. Y también, para contextualizar esta pregunta, también ponerlo en perspectiva de aquellos países que mantienen esquemas de seguridad social, en los cuales su sistema de pensión se ha convertido en un gran eh, inversor institucional, en el sector financiero de distintos países. Eh, se mencionaba el caso del mismo propio sistema de, de, verdad, de Reino Unido, eh, ya en otras instancias, con, con Kevin Esquerra, con quien hemos conversado sobre el caso de Canadá, hemos visto cómo incluso los trabajadores públicos de Canadá, mediante sus fondos de pensiones, invierten en empresas que privatizan el agua en Chile, por ejemplo con el fondo de Ontario Teachers, por dar un ejemplo. Eh, por lo tanto, eh, ¿cómo, ¿cómo es posible eh, recuperar este sistema de pensiones eh, en, en este contexto de eh, capitalismo de tasa cero y con la problemática de tener que hacer inversiones en los propios ahorros de los trabajadores que supuestamente están en contra de la privatización? Sin embargo sus sistemas de pensiones privatizan, incluso algunos servicios, tengo entendido, en el mismo Reino Unido, servicios de cuidado de infantes eh, y otro tipo de, de servicios. Por lo tanto, quizás podemos abordar esa primera pregunta y luego continuar con, con el resto. Invitamos también a que nos hagan llegar sus, sus preguntas. Uh. You can also ask me easy questions. I don't mind. <laughs> so, um, tengo, but, tengo un par de preguntas fáciles para el final. Um, there are a number of issues that you raised, all of which are very important. Um, let me tell you a few things about the UK system, which I mentioned um, briefly when I started as part of the talk. Um, there is a problem, a problem with the UK pension system. So it's, it, the, there's also a crisis there too. It's not as if the system is doing well. It's a system in crisis, but it's not the same as in Chile. It's not the same type of crisis. Although, although it does come from financialized capitalism, financialization. The UK system is quite different because um, pension funds have become like large institutions. Um, operating freely, not as regulated as Chile in, in terms of where they can put their money in. The, 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 the categories of investment are not as narrowly and, 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 and carefully defined as in Chile, where when you look at the pension funds, they all do the same thing. The Chilean pension funds, they all do the same thing. They all have the same range of um, assets. In the UK, they're quite different. They're like businesses. They're like private business operating as investment uh, outfits. In that context, though, they've got a problem. And the problem is that um, 
their liabilities are pensions and they're quite uh, rigid. They've got, they've got, and, and they've got liquidity demands. Their assets, um, if they buy shares, can be quite problematic. The UK um, um, uh, pension funds got badly burned um, in the stock market ups and downs, particularly the stock market uh, falls in, in the early 90s. They got badly burned. Um, as a result of which, they moved towards uh, government paper. They started accumulating government paper. And government paper is the same problem as the thing that I mentioned about Chile. It doesn't pay much. It doesn't pay much. The return is very low. And in addition to it, these pension funds had to find liquid, they, 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 they have need for liquid resources to keep paying the pensions as they mature, right? They, they need large liquid resources. And so they started manipulating their assets in order to ensure returns and to have sufficient liquidity. They were badly hit with the pandemic because they were speculating um, with government paper and they were speculating by using derivatives as well. They acted like spec speculating and speculative um, financial institutions and they're dealing with people's pensions. You're talking of completely responsible um, social structures here and, and, and social functioning. Not the same as in Chile, but equally um, problem similarly problematic and irresponsible. So the system is in crisis there too. The system is also in crisis in Germany to a certain extent because the returns are so low. Um, so it takes us to zero um, interest rate capitalism. Much of the trouble starts from that. The problem is structural. It's inherent. It's, it's, it, it is to do with financialization generally, driving interest rates down to zero. Um, how can it, be, can it be resolved? I don't know what the big capitalist powers might do, and I don't know what the big capitalist hegemonic blocks will do. And to, to a certain extent, it's not my business to advise them on that. Uh, what we could argue, however, is this, and that is important for restructuring. Pensions are part of the annual output of society. That's basically what they are. Pensions are not what you put away and then you get somehow magical returns 30 years later. Pensions are a share of the output of society. That's basically what they are. Um, pensions then must be redistributive and the mechanism must be such that people save, they support growth, and they get a share of current output uh, as a result. That must be publicly managed. It must be publicly managed and it must be uh, organized at the outset uh, in this way, and it must be redistributive. Now, that requires public ownership. It requires public ownership, and it requires public ownership over key resources as well. We've reached a stage when large states must consider now not only nationalizing the wage bill, not only nationalizing the uh, income statement, but also nationalizing equity, nationalizing property. That's the stage that we've reached, and they are not going to talk about it because, of course, that touches on property. But think about it. The large um, capitalist states have actually gone right against neoliberalism by paying people's wages, by sending people money through the post, and by uh, supporting large numbers of enterprises by giving them free credit. Yeah, well, they should take the next step and nationalize the equity as well. Bring them under national... Um, um, uh, management, bring them under social management. That is the way to begin to tackle um, the pension problem uh, structurally in, in, in the mature countries uh, as well. In addition to that, we also have the problem, of course, of population aging, which creates its own difficulties. Um, and that must be combined and dealt with in terms of rising productivity uh, of labor. We need a system that will increase the productivity of labor. Productivity of labor has not been rising very fast um, in mature capitalism. And don't listen to the talk about new technologies and so on. Yeah, it raises the productivity of labor, but not that fast. We therefore need sustained investment and we need a focus on production to raise the productivity of labor and take care of the old, take care of the weak, take care of those who cannot work like others, like any civilized 
society should do. Like any society based on um, principles of solidarity and principles of um, um, support uh, of different individuals and groups must do. That's about it for the difficult question. Bueno, gracias Costa, muy, muy interesante tu, tu respuesta. Llegamos eh, hasta la producción y, y la importancia de la productividad en estas alternativas. Sin duda que es algo muy relevante hoy día que en países como en Chile se discute ¿verdad? sobre cómo recuperar el control y el manejo de estos fondos para que cumplan su objetivo último, que es eh, el pagar pensiones que sean suficientes para quienes lo requieran. Eh, en ese contexto, hay otra pregunta eh, bien interesante relacionada con lo que tú mencionabas sobre cómo este es un periodo en el que observamos la fortaleza y la debilidad del Estado de forma simultánea, ¿verdad? Algo contradictoria. Eh, en cómo los países han ido enfrentando esta crisis en, en los países centrales, ¿cierto? Y estos países que tienen esta financialización de las periferias. Eh, la acción de los estados parece estar polarizando más, aún más, esta, esta diferencia, este salto, entre el centro y la periferia. ¿verdad? Vemos que países como Chile hoy día eh, no solo han recuperado esta idea de la austeridad, sino que la están aplicando bueno, a, a cierta conveniencia del capital, ¿verdad? pero también... Eh, muy fuerte en el discurso, eh, como una forma de congelar gastos y donde se está haciendo algo muy contrario al libreto que, que tú nos presentabas de países que, que han estado realizando gastos, incluso nacionalizando las nóminas de pago de, de grandes corporaciones de sus países. Por lo tanto, ¿esto contribuye a la distancia del centro y las periferias eh, en este contexto? ¿Se está polarizando aún más el orden mundial eh, y sus desigualdades con este proceso? Yes, that is absolutely the case. That's why we've got to differentiate between subordinate and dominant financialization. It's not the same, right? We do have financialization in Chile, we do have financialization in Turkey, in Thailand, in uh, um other places uh, across the world brazil argentina and so on but that must be understood as subordinate financialization and therefore uh, the conditions that apply and the terms that apply are different there uh, which i've tried to to make clear uh, that has implications for the state for the role of the state the subordinate role the subordinate integration of these countries into uh, the world system has not gone away i mean the idea of uh, core and periphery is an old Latin American idea. Uh, a lot of people thought that um, it has gone out of fashion because of uh, globalization and various other myths. Um, no, it hasn't. Um, capitalism recreates core and periphery uh, all the time, but it does it in a different way. Uh, incidentally, the recreation of core and periphery by capitalistic mechanisms is apparent in Europe. Europe has acquired its own core and periphery uh, the last 20 years uh, through financialization and so on. But beyond Europe, if you look at the rest of the world, um, yeah, it hasn't gone away. It's just has been restructured. And subordinate financialization is one key way in which core and periphery appears um, today. In that framework, the subordinate countries don't have the options and the um, possibilities for intervention, the state in those countries, as it does in the core countries, it's clear. I've been talking about the core countries setting the terms, but in the subordinate countries, actually, it is very different. Interest, interestingly enough, you can see that most clearly in Europe, which has acquired its own, as I said, core and periphery uh, division. So the core countries in Europe, Germany, France, and so on, have been leading, leading the charge um spending nationalizing uh, the wage bill the income statement and so on developing huge deficits and so on it's very clear the peripheral countries spain portugal greece very different story very different story 
inevitably they had to spend. Inevitably they have deficits because tax, tax income has collapsed, but they cannot do what the core countries are doing because they fear the implications of integration into the system, which is of course what's happening in subordinate countries across the world. It, the, the options are far more limited um, for those countries. Yes, when financialization derives from the global system, from global capital flows, from the role of the dollar, yes, you will always be very, very concerned and very worried and very um, troubled by that. And that is, to a certain extent, what we witness, I think, in Chile. And uh, that is deeply problematic. I showed you some evidence, which of course you know better than me, about the impact on consumption and so on. In that context, the Chilean government ought to be supporting people's income. It ought to be supporting uh, aggregate demand. It ought to be supporting the, the poor, but also the broader layers of people uh, in, 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 in consuming and, and, and maintaining their livelihoods. It shouldn't be spending money to allow banks to facilitate the cashing out of, um, of pension accounts, because that's what's happening. The central bank in Chile creates money to facilitate banks um, mediating the cashing out of, uh, of pension savings uh, by people. In other words, creating a huge problem uh, further down the line. This is irresponsible policy, um, and policy that the country doesn't need. They're destroying, they're ruining the economy, basically, uh, by, by, by doing that. But that is, these are the limitations of being a subordinate, uh, a subordinate country in this context. So any policy of definancialization will have to take that into account. Uh, to put it differently, you cannot definancialize effectively without somehow discussing capital controls as well. There must be capital controls. There must be mechanisms to provide uh, a measure of um, um, policy space that uh, can be effective uh, to bring in uh, uh, policies in favor of working people and to change the dysfunctional pension system. You can't proceed along the lines that are suggested by continuing to be fully integrated into the world financial system with free capital flows and with floating exchange rates. It doesn't work um, if you do that because the risks are uh, enormous. So in that context, I'm not surprised that a place like uh, Chile continues to think of austerity as a possibility uh, and so on. You see it in, you see it in Spain, you see, it in, you see it elsewhere. You even see it in Britain. Um, uh, the British government has spent a lot of money um, the last year trying to support the economy. Already they're talking about reimposing austerity next year. The, the minister or uh, the chancellor of the exchequer announced uh, yesterday effectively a move towards that. So we have to be prepared for that because, as I said, neoliberalism has reached the end of the road. Financialization has, has passed its peak. But that doesn't mean that it's going to go away. Nothing goes away, right? Not, unless you make it go away. So um, the ideology is still there. They use it flexibly. They do it. They do it in any way they like. They use it uh, the way to, that suits their interests. If it is in their interest to uh, uh, spend money, they do it. Uh, if it is in their interest to find money uh, hidden in some box, they do it. <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, when that goes, yes, they will try and shift the cost onto working people and uh, impose austerity. So um, that's, that, that, that's of crucial importance. One more point on this, on the weakness of the state. The neoliberal state is enormously powerful, it's clear. It is, uh, anyone who doubts that simply doesn't read what's happening in the world. It's enormously powerful, okay, in terms of what it can do. But it's also very weak, and it is very weak because 40 years of neoliberalism, whether at the core or in the periphery, whether at, in, in, in the leading countries or in the subordinate countries, 40 years of neoliberalism has definitely affected um, the structure of the state and the way in which it can respond and deliver things. Um, I mentioned earlier that Chile needs, a, seems to me, a public system, right? A public system of pensions. The public system of pensions is not easy to create, right? You need the right people to do it, you need personnel, you need mechanisms, institutions, and so on. Does the Chilean state have capacity to do it? I don't know at the outset. I mean, I would like to see um, more work on that because it's one thing to say we need a public system, quite another to make it happen. And 
if I judge by uh, what I see other states do um, in other peripheral countries, the ability of those states to deliver reform and to deliver deep change and to oppose um, the dominant mechanisms uh, of the capitalist uh, economy is not, 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 it's not evident. Uh, it's not clear. You need, the, in other words, you need, so the, the implication is what? We need a fight for the state as well. It isn't enough simply to say we want to definancialize. It isn't enough to say we want the public pension system or we want capital controls and so on. We need a fight for the state. We need to contest the state. We need, we need in other words, a state that is democratic, that it is run on democratic um, principles and that can deliver these, um, um, these, these reforms driven by the demands of working people. Uh, capital controls, for instance, how do you impose capital controls effectively? These are very demanding activities. And the modern state in a lot of developing countries hasn't got the capacity for that. Uh, it's, it's problematic. So the state is powerful, very powerful. The state is also weak. Uh, any kind of radical challenge uh, must also contest the state. The state isn't this thing out there. Right? It, it, it is a, it is a, a, a a terrain of contestation uh, and, 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 and uh, progressive and radical thinkers should be um, thinking of how to contest that too on a democratic basis uh, in favor of working people. Bueno, eh, gracias por la, por la respuesta, Costas. Nos lleva también a otras preguntas eh, complejas también de responder, pero vamos, lo importante acá que vamos eh, puntualizando algunos desafíos para los distintos también movimientos que se han ido eh, movilizando por la recuperación de la seguridad social y por la democracia, como tú bien señalas, respecto a no solo los, también los estados, sino también este sistema interestatal, ¿verdad? Y este gran orden económico también mundial. En ese contexto nos preguntan, eh, respecto a las protestas, que han ido ocurriendo recientemente en América Latina. Hoy día vemos varios países de la región eh, convulsos, ¿verdad? Eh, y también en, la, en las periferias eh, del capitalismo global, ¿verdad? Distintas manifestaciones. Tú mencionabas también el caso de los países de la periferia de la zona europea, ¿verdad? Eh, Cómo allá también se han manifestado procesos de contestación de organización, de transformación, y en ese contexto, bueno, la pregunta sobre las protestas en América Latina y cómo están relacionadas de alguna forma a nivel global, ¿cierto? Está, estamos viviendo un momento de convulsión, de movilización, y eh, qué rol pueden jugar en esto algunas políticas, tú ya hablaste de algunas, eh, y quizás alguna que mencionaste, en la cual podríamos profundizar, es la renta básica de emergencia, por ejemplo, como un mecanismo relevante hoy para poder enfrentar los desafíos en las distintas realidades nacionales, pero también a nivel mundial, ¿verdad? Porque dentro de esto también hay de, la desigualdad global también se va a expresar en, en esta posibilidad de tener una renta básica eh, de emergencia en los distintos estados. Eh, ¿Cómo tú ves esta, esta política que se ha planteado en distintos estados, desde distintos movimientos? ¿Y cómo ves hoy día los procesos de movilización, de protesta, tanto en América Latina como en el resto de las periferias? Y también, sin duda, países centrales que vemos hoy, cómo enfrentan también duras contradicciones eh, en los lugares más privilegiados del, del capitalismo. Um, okay. In terms of um, movements and opposition, at the moment we've got um, um, it's great disparity uh, across the world. Um, the decade uh, that has just passed, the previous decade, was a decade of um, uh, hope for many on the left, um, a kind of promise. In Latin America, we had a number of different uh, uh, regimes that wanted to challenge uh, the established uh, order, were critical and adopted policies that presumably challenged the established order. They didn't come to much. The end outcome was not very, um, uh, not very impressive. 
uh, in the end. Okay? That's a lesson that we've got to learn, that uh, if you're going to change things, you've got to be more radical than the regimes were in the previous decade. Elsewhere as well in the world were challenges to the system, um, two of which were very, very important. One in Britain with Brexit that came from the right, and um, one in Greece from the left that came with um, Syriza. The, the challenge in Greece from the left didn't come too much. It actually uh, didn't produce good results. The challenge uh, from the right is still going on in Britain. Um, and that is important. That is important because it tells you something about the left and about the right um, globally. It tells you that the left has lost confidence and um, doesn't really believe that it can make proposals about the world economy and about its own society that are actually, can actually be implemented. It doesn't really believe it. Um, um, it, it criticizes capitalism. It says that things are not right. It thinks, says that things are not nice, that, that uh, uh, we shouldn't be like that. But when it comes to how things can be different, and therefore we have to confront public property, public management, social organization, solidarity in practice, solidarity in production, solidarity in consumption, and so on, mechanisms and policies that make these things a reality, the left is very. Um, unsure of itself and it is ready to compromise it is ready to say yeah we can't do that it's too much and let's uh, step back let's not push it um, these things cannot be done and so on it is actually a moment of historic weakness for the left on the right we don't see that the right actually is prepared to say no no we'll change things and we'll do this and we'll do that you don't you can't trust the right obviously you can't uh, uh, you can't believe what they would say, but it, the difference in, uh, in, in approach is very, very striking. And it was nowhere more striking than in Britain, where the British people said Brexit, it was their democratic right. They might have been misled. I don't think they were, but they might have been. It was their democratic right. The only people who were uh, political organizations that were prepared to say, that's what the British people want, and that's what we're going to do, is the right. The left argued all sorts of other things because he was too scared of what it meant. There was a time in the past when the left was not so scared. He actually wanted to change things. It actually wanted to do, to bring changes about that were effective. That's what the left must recapture. And we're still not there, right? We're still not there. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. But in Latin America, there is a welcome revival. Chile is at the forefront for obvious reasons. The pension system is a disaster and doesn't work. The country needs something else and it needs it for its own people and it needs it for its own economy, for its own society, it's clear. Uh, but you're not gonna find it easy because as you know better than me, the opposition um, is, is strong, well entrenched and, and, and likes what it sees. And uh, why should the system change? I'm doing okay. <laughs> I get my funds, I make my profits. Um, so uh, you've got a struggle in front, of, in, in, in front of you, but that's a struggle that's important for all of Latin America and for the rest of us. Um, so that is a source of hope. In confronting that struggle and dealing with it, it's very, very important that the left makes proposals that are radical, doable, and believes in them actually believes in them, doesn't criticize capitalism, doesn't say capitalism is a bad idea or capitalism is a bad system. Everybody knows that. That's not nothing new. And it is no, it's no use saying capitalism is immoral. Thank you. We know that. We know that for, for centuries. The point is to propose something that can be done and actually implemented. And that's what we're discussing here, right? That's what we're discussing here. That's why what's happening is so important. Now, we're still some way from finding it. Now, why? loss of confidence. The main package that the left should propose is not that difficult. People know it. People know you've got to definancialize. You've got to, um, uh, to, to, to move to have public property in utilities. You've got to have public property in banks. You've got to have a system whereby you support the welfare state. You've got to have a mechanism where you support investment. You need industrial policy. You've got to have a mechanism whereby you support 
productivity growth. Uh, these things are well understood, not a problem. The difficulty is to have a political organization that believes in them and can make them a reality. Um, we're still some way from there. Um, but again, Latin America um, is a place of hope. So. Gracias, Costas. Eh, muy importante esa reflexión. Eh, nos ayuda también a, a poner en relieve la propuesta de la coordinadora NOMAS AFP, que ha desarrollado una propuesta concreta, ¿verdad? Es sustentable eh, y la demuestra, ¿verdad? Para transformar el actual sistema de cuentas individuales de pensiones privadas que tiene Chile hace ya 40 años, siendo uno de los primeros países a nivel mundial en implementar esta privatización radical y esta financiarización de, de las pensiones, ¿cierto? Eh, y en este contexto eh, nos van quedando ya las últimas preguntas. Eh, tú mencionabas eh, el rol eh, de liderazgo que juega Estados Unidos en esta financiarización mundial, eh, la importancia del rol del dólar en el comercio mundial, ¿verdad?, en, la, en las finanzas. Eh, y en ese contexto nos preguntan eh, sobre la relación de Estados Unidos y eh, China eh, en el contexto de la economía mundial eh, respecto a esta disputa hegemónica, ¿verdad?, que, que se vendría observando desde ciertas visiones. Eh, ¿Cuál puede ser el, el impacto en el en el corto plazo, de, hemos visto, por ejemplo, en distintos lugares del mundo los efectos de la guerra comercial, en fin. Eh, y por lo tanto nos preguntan eh, respecto a este punto y respecto también a, al rol que jugaría Estados Unidos eh, en este contexto de crisis, de, de declive, ¿verdad?, de, de esta financiarización también a nivel mundial, de declive de las tasas de ganancia, y por lo tanto cómo se observa esa relación y, por otro lado, el rol de China también a nivel mundial, en particular los países latinoamericanos, hemos visto, al igual que otros continentes como África, cómo crecientemente las inversiones chinas también han, han ido jugando un rol cada vez más relevante. Eh, por ejemplo, hoy hace poco en el sector eléctrico en Chile, eh, la participación de empresas chinas ya está siendo muy significativa en términos de, de lo que es el mercado. Eh, y en ese contexto preguntarte por esa relación y cómo eh, se da en este contexto de financiarización eh, y de crisis producto de la pandemia. Um, that is the $64,000 question for the future of capitalism, obviously. The, the fight, the struggle for, he, for, for hegemony. Um, China is the only serious contestant at the moment, it's clear. China is the only serious contestant, and it is a serious contestant because it's a continental economy with a significant uh, manufacturing base. Uh, and crucially, crucially, um, a system, a ruling elite with a political structure that perceives itself as independent of the United States uh, and wants to push its independent interests. Um, the pandemic so far has been a test. It's been a test of, um, in a sense, state mechanisms. And the truth is, China has won it. China has actually, China has actually uh, performed um, uh, better than the United States for reasons of um, centralization of power, the way in which centralized and peripheral provincial power in China relate to each other, and the provincial power relates to local society. Um, the United States uh, has a system which is federal, um, imperial and dominant, we all know for many, uh, for many decades, but that system did not function well in terms of coping with the, uh, the shock of the, uh, uh, the pandemic and what needed to be done and for responding to the needs of working people and for meeting with fund the fundamental public health um, needs. The Chinese system performed much better. It performed much better in terms of intervening, in terms of testing, in terms of tracing, um, and, and in terms of limiting the spread of the disease, it's obvious uh, in terms of the results. Um, so 
China, in terms of state action, has demonstrated that he has capabilities that the United States um, has uh, allowed to atrophy. And um, again, that's not surprising. The United States has been the leading country of neoliberalism. The neoliberal state is enormously powerful. No state is more powerful than the United States powerful, but the United States um, government at the moment. Militarily, politically in terms of resources. And yet, it is also very, very weak internally. It has actually been hollowed out internally in terms of what it can do because of the sustained war against it. It is dominated by narrow financial interests. There's a hegemonic bloc that, that controls the state and that has actually also weakened the state. So in terms of the contest for, for, for hegemony between the states and China, um, this year has been, um, China has done better. China, China has established a stronger claim uh, to hegemonic role. But again, one must not run ahead. Um, hegemony today depends obviously on guns and the United States has got more guns than China and will continue to have more guns than China for a long time. But it also depends on money. It's guns and money that secure he hegemony. Um, and the United States also controls money. There is no way that the Chinese won, the renminbi, will be able to contest the hegemonic position of the dollar in the, in the, in the foreseeable future. It just won't happen uh, because of the structure of capitalism in China, because of the nature of its uh, financial transactions and financial mechanism, which we, we cannot discuss in depth here. But there is no way that uh, um, this uh, currency will be able to uh, undermine the dollar uh, in, in the foreseeable future. So the ability of the United States to project imperial power remains phenomenal and that is still the hegemonic power. However, the, the, the reactions within the instability and the, the frictions that we see between different uh, components of uh, um, the US elite and the distance between the political system and, and the people uh, in the United States is remarkable. It's 40 years of financialization, 40 years of uh, stagnant real wages, 40 years of enormous inequality, 40 years of privilege for a few people who control the states. Um, and that has created a situation, uh, explosive situation. I mean, that, that is now the epicenter of class conflict uh, across the world. It's in, it's in the United States. That's, that's where it's happening. Um, so the United States remains hugely powerful. It remains a dominant hegemonic power. It controls the main levers of, of, of hegemony, but internally it is much weaker than it used to be. And that, is, that was demonstrated in the course of the, uh, of the pandemic crisis. Um, I don't know which way it's going to unfold, and nobody does. You shouldn't believe anybody who tells you that they know um, how it's going to unfold. Um, what is for sure though, is that we're going to see um, an intensification of, 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 of tensions with the new administration. Um, the more aggressive liberal side uh, is back in power. They are imperialists. They will project power. Um, they will probably start wars again. Um, so ahead of us, we've got a period of um, intensified tensions, uh, political unrest, political instability as financialized capitalism is in decline. That's the state of affairs and that's why it's crucial that the left comes up with uh, concrete ideas, confidence and, and specific proposals. No more, no more talk. Enough time for talk. It's over. We need specific things from now on. Sí, qué importante reflexiones a costas. Estamos en el tiempo de las propuestas. Ya, ya, ya se conversó demasiado, ¿verdad? Así que eh, queda un desafío importante para las fuerzas de transformación de poder generar estas propuestas concretas y tomar acción. Eh, en ese contexto también, y ya para ir cerrando esta conferencia, agradeciéndote eh, tu tiempo y haber compartido con nosotros, también a quienes nos han estado ayudando en la traducción y a todo el equipo que ha estado trabajando en la transmisión, eh, y preguntarte... Eh, si podías darnos algunas palabras finales, una reflexión para, para ya ir cerrando este espacio. Y nos preguntaban si podías comentar algo más 
también sobre eh, la renta básica de emergencia, que por ahí nos preguntaban eh, como una política concreta que podría tener un impacto y que acá se mira con bastante interés, al igual que en otros países del mundo. Eh, así que, de pronto, si nos puedes contestar eso y, y ya para ir cerrando la, la conferencia. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, it slipped my mind. I got caught up with China and the US. <laughs> it slipped my mind. Um, the pandemic has hit working people harder than anybody else. This is a disease that hits the poor. It's clear. It hits the poor uh, more than the rich uh, in terms of public health. It hits the poor uh, in terms of their income, in terms of their livelihood. It's clear. This is a this is a class-based disease now. It's, it's, it's evident, right? And the and the poor have suffered, and the 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 public health provision for the poor is very very uh, problematic across the world because of what's been happening to the welfare state so in this context the left needs to intervene with concrete immediate proposals uh, it's no use saying we need the public employment program of course we need a public employment program but a public employment program takes time it takes time to to operate it takes time to put in in place of course we need to support um people's livelihoods through a variety of uh, institutional and other measures but these things also take time here we've got a situation which is very very harsh people are cashing in their pensions in in, in chile and elsewhere uh, the same is happening in so many different countries um, in the developed world where the working class is feeling huge pressure in this context and given what the state has already done which is to send money and to spend money like there is no tomorrow, it is time for the left to put across a demand for a pandemic basic income. There is a big debate on basic income, I know, and I don't want to go over it again. This isn't an argument about uh, a permanent uh, reform and so on. This is a, an argument about the pandemic. For the period of the pandemic, for another six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it is, depending on the country, we need a concrete demand for the state to support uh, people's income as a matter of right. If it can support uh, private business, if it can support banks, it can support working people as well. If it can spend money on, on, on just about everything else, it can spend money on income. And it can spend money on income as a matter of right to see us through. We've done a lot of work, which will be published very soon, on the case of Spain. And there it is easy to see that the policy of a pandemic basic income for a, for, a, for, a, for a definite period of time, eight months, 12 months, whatever it is, it's a matter of policy and political decision in each country would be very beneficial. It would allow the country to get over the worst of the shock and it would allow people to deal with the tremendous impact of, of poverty and destruction of livelihoods. So that is one kind of concrete demand that the left should be putting right now. Uh, in the midst of the pandemic, demand uh, uh, a radical policy of, uh, of, of a pandemic basic income. For us, that pandemic basic income, the sourcing of it, must be through uh, a, a radical tax reform as well. We've argued that that is how it should happen. Yes, the state should, should, should spend the money to support people's income uh, urgently, and he should finance that policy in next year and so on through a radical tax reform that actually redistributes income from the rich to the poor because the levels of inequality in so many countries, including in Chile, uh, are astonishing. So that's a kind of concrete demand I can put through. And believe me, a lot of people um, uh, immediately respond to it. That's a demand that can catch uh, immediately among people and find um, great popular uh, support uh, a radical demand for, 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 for basic income, it is up to us to discuss uh, what form uh, to give it. That's the kind of policy that I would be very interested in discussing, developing, and supporting because it's the kind, it has the kind of concreteness that allows us to deal with the here and now and to propose ways in which we can really begin to overturn um, financialized capitalism and all its terrible effects on uh, working people and society in general. Bueno, Costa, gracias también por esa, por esa aclaración sobre la renta básica. Eh, esperamos que, así como nos acompañaste hace un par de años, en 2018, acá en Santiago, 
ojalá en un par de años más, 2022, podamos compartir nuevamente, eh, quizás acá, eh, y seguir con estas propuestas importantes, como tú dices, para resolver los problemas, las urgencias de hoy, construyendo también las alternativas para este sistema que está en sus últimos eh, momentos, por lo que tú también nos, nos has ilustrado tan eh, potentemente. Eh, así que agradecer nuevamente eh, a todas y todos también quienes han seguido esta transmisión en los distintos lugares y a quienes la van a poder seguir también eh, posteriormente a, a, a través de nuestras redes, ya que compartiremos también este material junto con el resto de las presentaciones del seminario. Así que nuevamente muchas gracias Costas, eh, muchas gracias también a todas y todos quienes nos acompañaron, a las organizaciones que participaron también eh, de este seminario, eh, y eh, les dejamos invitados e invitadas a que revisen también el material eh, en nuestras redes. Así que con eso nos despedimos, Costas un, un saludo afectuoso, eh, y nos vemos prontamente. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, you're doing a very important uh, job over there in Chile and in Latin America. Uh, a lot of eyes are on you. Keep, keep at it. Um, and uh, if there's anything that uh, we can do to cooperate and collaborate with you here in Europe, we would be delighted to do so. Muchas gracias, Costas. Bueno, con esas palabras entonces nos despedimos. Hasta la próxima. Muchas gracias. Bye now.